So today we're going to talk about uh, the enabling role of grid enhancing technologies or GETs, right? One of my favorite topics and their use cases in, in, in grid operations and planning. So let's start with why, right? Why you always start with why we, we are, you know, what's the problem and why we, we want to consider grid enhancing technology. Well, the power industry has changed a lot. Like if you if you think about it from the from the operation side, traditionally, uh, on the generation side, you only need to deal with mostly traditional generators like uh, uh, you know uh, thermal, uh, natural gas, uh, nuclear, or you know hydro, right? And load is mostly conventional load, so it's relatively easy to match the generation with the forecasted load. That's what we call in the power system industry that we match the generation schedule to the forecasted load. Now things has changed significantly. Like we add a lot more moving parts, both from the generation side, as well as from the load side, right? If you think about power industry as kind of like the three sections, generation and load on the two side and transmission kind of like a pipeline in between, ideally the transmission system is designed for a system that has relatively stable generation and, and load, right? That's what happened for a long time in our power system industry. However, you can see that in recent years, both the generation side and the load side, there's some fast movement there. There are a lot of activities on the generation side. There are a lot of activities on load side as well. That makes the balancing problem much harder to do, right? Ideally, you should have, you know, you should change your middle uh, uh, pipeline to match the, the quick movement from the load side and the generation side. However, you know, you cannot just like plug in, you know, or change your transmission line very quickly. That's where the problem occurred, right? If you don't have the right location, uh, if you don't design your transmission system for the right location to handle the right capacity injecting to the grid and withdraw from the grid, you will have a congestion problem or you have an overload problem, right? That's what you can see from the total day ahead market congestion costs. For all the ITO, all the RTOs from uh, 2016 and to, to all the way to 2022, you can clearly see that, especially since from 2020, the total congestion has increased a lot because of a lot of the renewables are trying to integrate into the system. You also have a lot of retirement scheduled or already happening in the system, right? That caused a lot of uh, you know challenges in the in the in the in the operations, in the real time operations. On the planning side, however, things are not getting easier. Actually, it's, it's more more challenging, right? Because the planners today, uh, they have a lot of goals to fulfill, not only building the transmission line, but they also need to consider all these different uh, uh, goals in their, in their transmission process. And on top of that, we also have a large amount of uh, renewable generation that tries to get into the grid, right? To connect into the grid. As you can see here, the MISO, uh, interconnection queue, they have close to 200 gigawatts of renewable uh, projects in their queue. And you can clearly see that the number is get, not getting lower, right? So what we can expect is that, you know, both the average time until project commercial operating date is going to increase, you know, going forward. And also you can expect a more expensive network upgrade cost. And that's actually what happened, right? And the U.S., according to a DOE study, U.S. will need 60% additional transmission capacity by 2030, right? And that's a challenge. I'll give you some numbers. It takes an average about 10, 8 to 10 years to build a high-voltage transmission line, right? And we're already 2023. You know, it's only seven years. You know, not enough time, right? So if you're, if you're familiar with mathematical programming, whenever a constraint cannot hold, Right. If you're planning constraint that you want to avoid a, a, a feasibility issue, what do you do? You add something called a slack variable into your constraint to make it solve. Right. So the grid enhancing technology here is my definition of the slack variable in this transmission system. It actually bridges the transmission gap in a much quicker and more cost effective way to resolve or at least defer the transmission needs while we're building and waiting for the more transmission line to be built. Eventually, we'll need more transmission lines to be built. But during the process, the grid enhancing technology is a great tool to bridge that capacity gap. And even, even better, 
like in, in, in mathematical programs, you add a slack variable, usually you will add a penalty into your objective function, make your objective function much more expensive. However, here, it's the other way, right? You actually make your total cost much cheaper if you do it in the right way. So what greedy enhancing technologies are we talking about here? Uh, I'm mainly focused on three of them. Now, first is called dynamic line rating. As you can tell from the name, dynamic line rating is that you can use either a, a software-based solution or hardware-based solution to dynamically calculate the rating of the line based on real-time condition, right? It can also predict the near-term you know, rating by incorporating the weather forecast into the calculation algorithms. And that's very important because you know, all the ISOs, they run a energy market and the energy market always look ahead, right? Energy market is different from EMS, which is the status of your current system status, right? Energy market on the other side, always look ahead. For example, the generation schedule now is actually determined approximately 7.5 minutes ago in California ISO's market, right? If you consider the generation commitment status, it's actually even further back, about 37.5 minutes ago. So the market is always looking ahead. So having that near-term rating prediction is actually super, super important. Another good thing about dynamic line rating is that it collects and analyzes the grid data in real time. And this data can actually be used by our you know, asset management or long-term planning for their risk assessment or their you know, granular, more granular rating de 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 determination in their planning process. So this is dynamic line rating. Um, advanced power flow control, uh, or APFC, is another type of uh, uh, grid enhancing technology that, that mainly aims to reroute power flow to some of the underutilized lines using you know, either phase shifting devices or impedance control devices on the line, right? Because otherwise you cannot really control the flow. It just you know, follows whatever the least impedance path in the AC system, right? But the power flow, the advanced power flow uh, control or APFC actually helps you to do that. Um, one of the, the advantage of using or you know, uh, considering APFC in the system is that it can help you maximize your transfer capability by kind of equalizing the impedance across the, the, uh, the parallel path. Imagine if you have a parallel path, meaning that you have like more than one lines connecting two zones. If like one line have a, a, you know, a lower or higher impedance, then naturally the line will gonna carry more or less flow, right? Creating the imbalance in the system. By equalizing the impedance, you can actually maximize the transfer capability between two zones or two areas. And it can also potentially assist the system oscillation damping, like the transient stability part if it implemented strategically, right? Especially after some major contingencies. Um, so this is the, the, the use case, some of the use case for the APFC. Um, the topology optimization is kind of similar to uh, advanced power flow controlling in the sense that it also reroutes power flow to other lines in the system. However, it uses a, it uses a different technology. Instead of changing the impedance or the, the, the phase angle on the line, it actually changed your topology. Remember what I said that you have the middle pipeline that is very hard to change? The topology optimization is actually trying to help you with that. Um, you know, one some of the use cases, you know, it can open, you know, or switching or switch out some of the lines based on the real-time needs. Or it can also change the bus configuration at your substation to dynamically, you know, changing your, your uh, you know, topologies to accommodate real-time operations. Um, and of, co of course, all, all of these three technologies add flexibility to meet operations and planning needs. Let's talk about some of the common line methodologies if you're not, uh, line rating methodologies if you're not already familiar with them. So we have a spectrum of the rating methodologies, uh, rating methodologies, all the way from the most conservative, which is, is called the static rating. Basically, we assume that one rating across the year, right, based on some very conservative ambient condition. For example, you know, during the sum summertime, we consider like 120 degree F or a 50 degree C, you know, as the ambient degree. But most of the time you don't reach 50 degree C, right? During the summer, hopefully not in Bay Area, uh, not even in Sacramento area, actually. Um, 
Then you have seasonal rating. Seasonal rating is actually used most commonly in today's ISOs and utility. Right? Typically, we have two seasons, one for summer and one for winter. And for each season, we have the normal and emergency rating, right? The normal rating is for M minus zero, meaning that the, the overload is there without a contingency, right? A contingency is something that, you know, the line goes out or generation goes out without plan. That's what we call contingency in, 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 in the power industry. And we also have emergency rating. Emergency rating is used for evaluating power flow post-contingency. Right. If you have something unplanned happen in a system, then for a short duration, typically 30 minutes, sometimes four hours, depending on how much the, the emergency rating is good for, we use emergency rating to evaluate that, that post-contingency power. Right. And moving to the more dynamic side, we have something called the ambient adjusted rating or AAR, where you use the temperatures, um, maybe solar irradiations to calculate your line rating. And this is actually what's uh, required by FERC order 881. So all the utilities need to implement uh, AARs by 2025, I believe, uh, to consider the ambient conditions and, and possibly solar irradiation, because it really doesn't make sense to assume there are solar irradiations during the midnight, because there's no solar, right? There's no solar. So that's what ambient adjusted rating is for. Dynamic line rating is very similar to ambient adjusted line rating. Um, it's just more considered more a wider range of weather and line specific factors. For example, like what additional uh, uh, limiting element could be on the line, right? That's something that can be considered in dynamic line rating. And both the AAR and DLR falls into the category of weather adjusted line rating or uh, WALR. You know, later on, if I use WALR, I mean either AAR or DLR, right? So this is the spectrum of the line rating that is commonly used in all operations, how they're used. In, like I said, in all operations, you know, by default, you use um, seasonal ratings for operations planning studies. And engineering is going to use those ratings in their, in their study cases. However, if in real time, the engineers and operators see the needs, they most of them have options to switch to a temperature adjusted rating in real time. Okay? What my experience you know, in the company that I work for is that you look at the temperature forecast today. Okay, the temperature forecast is 80 degree or 85 degree, like the peak. Um, however, we know that the line rating in their rating assumptions, they use 50 degrees C. There's never gonna be there or 100 de 120 degree uh, Fahrenheit, right? So they will de develop those temperatures adjust rating usually at either five degrees, every five degrees or every 10 degrees. And they provide a rating there for the operators to use when they need it. Uh, in planning, most of the ISO and the utilities today, they still use seasonal rating. Some of them use even use the static rating. Uh, that's probably because, you know, they don't observe a lot of congestion in their system, so they don't feel the needs of, of using uh, a seasonal rating or more dynamic rating. But, you know, if they see overload congestions more frequently, uh, they should be considering those, uh, you know, more dynamic rating and they would. The dynamic rating, uh, the dynamic line rating can benefit the grid in many ways. I already talked about some of the, the, the benefits here in my previous slides, but you know, I want to highlight one thing that is, you know, it helps you that using a dynamic line rating actually helps you identify the limiting factors of your transmission line, because not all the transmission line are limited by the conductors, which the dynamic line rating is able to help, right? However, if you have, if you use a static rating or a seasonal rating that is always lower than your next limiting element, then you're not going to see your next limiting element, right? But once you apply the dynamic line rating, it actually tells you how much the conductor is good for for each section. Now you have the opportunity to see what on the transmission line is really limiting it, right? so that you, you know what to invest if you need to make a case. And most of the time, upgrading a breaker or a CT, those can be the limiting element, is much cheaper than building an additional transmission line. So that actually enable you to have more visibility of your transmission asset into your system. And it adds more flexibility right, in, in operations as well and provide more valuable data for long-term planning use, which I already talked about in my previous slides. So I talk all these good things about 
dynamic line ratings, right? You know, um, um, I want to show you a case study that we recently completed on, uh, you know, WECC 10K bus synthetic case. Um, so this is the network data. Uh, we have a thousand with ten thousand buses, you know, almost 2,500 generators, and we have all these branches and n minus one contingencies. So on a very high level, what we do is we run a DC power flow and a full contingency, full DC contingency analysis for all the 87, 84 hourly cases of the year. That year that we use happened to be a leap year. Otherwise, this should be 87, 60, right? <laughs> uh, so you can tell that it's, you know, 2016 data is what we use. Uh, so we we provide we, we do the, the 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 hourly generation the renewable generation pattern and hourly load is part of the case package. However, we select we, we, we well, for, first of all we run the initial DC power flow and contingency analysis right for every hours of the uh, in the system uh, every hour of the year, and then we identify twenty five most severely loaded line in the case, and we apply the weather information. We got the weather information for those lines, including ambient temperature, wind speed, wind direction, solar radiation, and data time, to get, you know, elevation as well. And then we applied a calculator that we developed based on the IEEE 738 2012, which is the standard for calculating overhead transmission line rating, right? So basically we use the steady state heat balance equation to calculate the, the weather adjusted rating for those 25, 25 lines. And then, we plug in the new rating into the system and rerun the hourly cases with the contingency. And um, we generate some results, actually shows uh, some very promising results by applying uh, the, the uh, weather adjusted line rating. And here are some of the results that you can see. This is one of the lines that we pick here. The static rating of the line is the orange line, right? It's, you know, slightly above 300 megawatt. And if you don't apply any cap, I'm going to talk about the cap later on, but if you don't apply any cap, these are the hourly rating that you can get. Some of them are really high. There's more than 200%, right? Um, but in reality, you're likely not going to get like 200% rating increase because you have, like I said, you have other limiting element in the system. So in this study, we applied a rating cap at 30% higher. That's the 1.3 uh, AAR cap that we applied there. But you can tell that consistently whether it, whether adjusted line rating um, exceed the static rating. Maybe some of the time it drops slightly below, but this is good information, right? As a utility, as a transmission line owner, you would rather know that during this time of the day, this time of the hour, you, your line rating is actually lower than what you planned for. Then later on, you know, your line got burned or the, the you know, got damaged for, you know, carrying too much power. Um, moving to the right, you have the duration curve here. You see that among the 25 lines that we selected here, the best line at 99.2% of the time of the year, the calculated, the weather calculator rating is actually above the static rating. Even the worst one is 76 one, 76%, right? Which is still majority of the time of the year. And like I said, for those durations where the rating is lower than static rating, one, it's good information for the transmission owner to know. Second, if it has happened too frequently, then the transmission owner should probably look into their rating methodology and assumptions and trying to accommodate that and do some calibrations, right? But the bottom line is, uh, you know, applying a weather adjustment line rating is, uh, is, you know, most likely will give you uh, additional capacities on your line. Some more results, um, you know, the weather adjusted line rating is actually very effective in reducing or even eliminating the overload. Like for the 10 to 20% overload category, like in the base case, reference case, where no adjusted rating is made, you see about, you know, 8,000 cumulated hour overload in, in the base case. However, the number reduced to about 5,000, you know, for the, the weather adjusted rating case with cap. You know, if we if you remove that 1.3 cap, right? That's it's going to have fo help further. It's reduced to you know even less than 3,000 uh, cumulated cumulated hour. And you know, for the you know mo more more severely loaded loaded line, actually it helps even more. Like some of them shows like more than 80 percent reduction in um, overload or completely eliminate the overload. On the right side, it tells you at 
each hour of the day, right? How um, the weather adjusted line rating is compared to the, the base case, right? In the base case, you probably cannot see the number very clearly, but that's fine. All you can tell, you, all you need to know is this is much greener, right? And greener is always better, right? But I'm going to tell you the number, right? The number is, you know, in this heat map, the 27% is the worst average overload and happened during sometime in January, early morning, right? In this synthetic case, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the case in, in, in real world, but in this synthetic case, that's the case. However, after applying the weather adjusted line rating, that number reduced from 27% to about 10%. That's huge increase, right? And we also evaluated all the different factors, the weather factors, and how to see how they can implement, uh, how they, how they uh, uh, impact the line rating. Actually, you know, the temperature, as you can tell, right, you know, if you, if you have a lower temperature, the heat is going to be, you know, pulled out from the, the conductor much quickly so that naturally you have a lower, uh, you have a higher uh, rating when, you, when your ambient temperature is low. Wind speed is different, right? If you don't have any wind, it takes longer time to uh, decimate that heat from the conductor. However, if you have a uh, you know higher wind speed, then you know the heat is going to be bring away from the conductor much quickly. That's why you see a, a higher um, uh, wind adjusted rating. The the degree is actually the the angle between the wind and your uh, your conductor axis, right? Um, when you have a perpendicular direction between your wing and your and your conductor axis, that's when the wing is most effective, right? That's why you can tell when the degree is 90 degree, um, the rating is the highest, right? By you know fixing everything else. And the solar irradiation is the same thing, right? If you have more solar, you, you will see a lower line rating. However, the effect is not that much. There are still some challenges um, implementing a full a kind of DLR or weather adjusted uh, line rating in today's operations, right? And I'm gonna, you know, these are some of the, the, the challenges that I can see based on my experience and also some of the solutions that I offer here. First is rating uncertainties and volatility, right? Like I said, the binding schedule is always happening before the actual dispatch schedule, like 7.5 minutes and 35 minutes I talked about before, right? So if you look ahead, and when you calculate the, the, the binding the interval, the dispatch interval, say the rating is 500, but suddenly during the seven minute or 30 minutes time duration, wind stop blowing or something happened, then you may have a different rating, right? How to incorporate the rating difference into this real-time operation rating calculation market you know, scheduling is actually a challenge now, right? And also the market is running continuously meaning that it keep looking ahead, right? Like, you know, a couple of hours, four and a half hours or three and a half hours, things like that, and keep calculated ratings. However, the weather forecast can change across different runs and give you a different rating every time you run it, right? So the rating uncertainties and volatilities is one of the challenges. The solution is simple, right? Solution, well, not very simple, but very straightforward. Improve your forecast algorithm, right? That's something that you can work on. Improve, improve your forecast algorithm and incorporate a risk-based buffer. You don't have to adjust for every difference, small difference, right? You only adjust if the difference is large enough. And if you have a difference that's too large, maybe consider using a cap, right? Don't, don't use that. Don't use that very extreme rating that is calculated by the, the real-time calculation. And the data management is another challenging issue, right? You know, in grid operations, we have all different grid applications like SCADA that sends the data back from the field, and you have EMS systems, state estimators, OMS is your altitude management system, and market engine, right? All the system kind of connect one way or another together. So apply a rating. You need to make sure the data is, you know, flowing very smoothly across these different applications. Because otherwise, it could create some problems. So the solution is to establish a centralized rating database with rating priorities. What is the most important rating, right? For example, the operator overwrites is probably the highest priority. And then, you know, the next priority is the, you know, good sensor data that come back from the field. And next may be your seasonal rating. And next may be your, you know, static rating, let's say. I just give you an example. And adopt, a, you know, a standard protocols between, community, you know, different for communication between different systems is also very important. 
On the policy front, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot, to, a lot because Julia is going to do a deep dive, but lack of incentive is another thing, right? The utilities and TOs, they have incentive to build new, new lines because they can put it into the rate, rate base. However, for weather adjusted line rating, that's not very straightforward at this time. And the solution is, uh, you know, to provide more effective incentives and mechanisms um, for utilities to consider uh, rate enhancing technologies. What about using more granular rating in planning? Um, that's a challenging topic. But instead of, you know, go directly to our rating, hourly rating for the entire year, we can do baby steps, right? Right now, we do, like, you know, some utilities use static rating, some utilities use two seasonal rating. How about we look at the data history, do some advanced analysis, and change the rating to maybe a monthly rating or day and night rating, right? That itself is a good improvement. For example, if you look at the data here, like, you know, maybe you can use this red rating here for January. And for February to April, you can use even higher rating than your 30% cap, right? You know, for summertime, you know, you can use a lower rating. But as soon as you pass that summer, getting into October time frame, you can slightly use your, your, your you, know, you know, increase your rating to a higher number. So this is something that you should consider in long-term planning. And the best way to do this is to use the real-time data that you collected from your sensor that you installed on your line. So let's do some mentor exercise here, okay? Um, so this is two, two um, areas, right? One is a uh, gen hub, the other is load center, right? You send power from the, the gen hub to load center. The solution is, uh, the, the, the task is that you need to find the pre-contingency total transfer capability, like how much power flow you can transfer from your, your generation side to load side. This is actually operation 101 if you work for a utility or ISO, right? So you need to, remember, you need to consider contingency. You always need to make sure the MIS-1, right? So this MIS-1 is losing one of the lines. You still, after you're losing one of the lines, you still need to make sure the remaining line, power flow on the remaining line, is still within its emergency limit, which is 1,200 megawatt. And the solution for this one, I already give you to, is 1,600 megawatt pre-contingency, right? Let's see how APFC and TPO may increase this number. So if you use APFC, you know, it could be a power, you know, power electronics devices, uh, that's more advanced, or it could be a simple, uh, you know, a serious reactor or serious capacitor on the line, right? But if you can do that, you have the potential to increase your pre-contingency TTC to greater than 600 megawatt. Because once you, you know, for example, once you lose that contingency line, you can quickly insert a larger impedance, like serious reactor, larger impedance to increase the impedance of the line so that it'll, you know, reroute the power flow of that line to different lines in the system, right? That's one way you can consider TTCs. Uh, sorry, you can consider uh, uh, APFCs into the system to increase your TTC. The topology optimization is similar, right? Um, imagine you have a different but smaller path in your system. That's more limiting, right? It's like a smaller path, you know, it's only, only good for maybe a couple hundred megawatt or 150 kV lane. However, you still need to make sure that you know, the, M the system is minus, M minus one stable. Um, so if you lose this line, there's no overload, no overload on this line, right? If you don't open any line, then this path will be your limiting path. However, if you can, you know, somehow open somewhere in between, you still have all the load connected, some load maybe radio, but you still have the, uh, you know, all the load connected. However, in this case, you will, um, you know, drastically increase your total pre-contingency TTC from 840 megawatt to 1600 megawatt. I'm not gonna go to the details. You all have the slides later on. You can look at my notes. Um, but this is how the APFC and TPO can potentially benefit the system. This is another case, right? This is something that I talked about earlier. Uh, if you have a parallel path with you know, different impedance, then one line could carry more flow than the other. When you calculate your uh, transfer limit, the you know the the most limiting line most limiting line could be limiting your your transfer capability. However, if you can uh, balancing the if you can balance the impedance of the the parallel path, then you have the opportunity to further increase your transfer capability. The get solution can also be combined and supercharge each other. Right, um, each of them is is effective, but when you put them together, it actually supercharges each other. Look at this case. 
right? Previously, you have a you know new bus where you connect a new wind generator, but you know in order to protect for that n minus one contingency, now you have a overload on the two lines nearby, right? And the traditional solution, you know, you may always you know build another transmission line between bus one and two or bus two and three, but that's you know first of all very expensive. Second, it's going to take a long time. Um, what you can consider is you know, install, maybe consider install a power flow controlling devices on this, uh, you know, line between bus one and bus two. That by changing the impedance or, or, or the phase angle on that line, it can shift the power flow from, you know, this line to somewhere else. In the system. And hopefully that doesn't cause additional overload in the system, right? Um, and this line, since it's located in the high wind area, otherwise you wouldn't put it wind there, right? Since it's located in high wind area, this could be a AAR or DLR candidate. You just need to do the study and see how high wind is gonna help you with your line ratings, right? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'm already over time, but you know, there are several highlights I wanna make sure, sure that, I, that I hit here is that for operations, it's really important to study before implementing uh, because some of these technologies will actually have some you know, system impact. Uh, stability impact or protection impact. You need to make you need to make make sure that you understand the system impact before you implement them. During the planning, it's important to consider these technologies in planning, not to the point that you need to predict the exact hour and minute when to use it in operations, but to give operations more tools in their toolbox that when they need to use it, they can find it in their toolbox. That's really important. We talk about GATS, right? GATS is cost effective and it's speedy response to uh, respond to our increasing demand for transmission. Uh, and it can accommodate, potentially accommodate more renewables. GATS benefit can be locational and time dependent. So leveraging insights, leveraging insights from the data analytics is very important to give you the, the best value of the GATS. Strategically combining GATS solutions is gonna supercharge each other and give you more uh, value. And a holistic planning approach that consider both gets and the traditional solution is going to optimize the value overall. Um, finally, forward thinking regulations and you know incentivizations is pivotal in you know catalyzing the skilled option of gets, which Julia is going to cover in more detail. All right, I think that's the end. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And if you have any like partnership or anything you want to talk to me, feel free as well. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Selker. I'm the executive director of the Watt Coalition and going to talk about the policy puzzle behind the technical puzzle that you just heard about. Uh, the Watt Coalition is a trade association um, representing the three technologies that I talked about. Uh, we're advocating for wide deployment of those technologies, which is not currently happening in the United States for reasons we hinted at, and we'll get into in more depth. Our members are technology companies, renewable energy developers. You probably recognize some names like Invenergy or EDF Renewables. Uh, also AES, uh, utility and developer, Vermont Electric Power Company, which owns the transmission system in Vermont. And Hasi is a clean energy investment group. So these are all entities that want to see more efficiency, more capacity out of the current grid and the future grid as well. Um, but the question is, why did this group have to come together to advocate for these technologies that uh, in the previous presentation you saw have a lot of value? So here's an example. Uh, the U.S. did start pilots for DLR and discussions for DLR back in the early 2000s, even late 90s. But abroad, Belgium uh, started even earlier and, and had wide deployment of DLR starting in 2012. And just one example of the benefits of that deployment is that in one day, they saved uh, $500,000, it might have been euros, in redispatch costs, which are their equivalent of congestion costs. So $500,000 in one day. Um, since 2012, that's piled up. Uh, in Slovenia, in 2013, they started deploying DLR and... Uh, you can see that the value of DLR is not just in the um, you know, basic grid configuration, but in contingency scenarios, you see even more uh, DLR value or at least a uh, number of events uh, where DLR is useful. And in advanced power flow control, you see the same thing that one story of APFC was that um, they were looking at rebuilding a line in a, a contingency situation to address a uh, contingency. 
And that APFC was a much better value. They put that in instead. It was never used, but it still saved a lot of money because the line would have otherwise had to be built. Uh, Germany, Uruguay, other countries are using DLR widely. In the United States, the first market integrated deployment was in Pennsylvania in 2022. Pretty recently, um, the use case here is incredible. Instead of a $50 million line rebuild, they did a $250,000 dynamic line rating installation, and it saves $23 million a year in grid congestion. So the savings pile up fast. We talk about payback periods of between um, two years or yeah, six months and two years usually for grid enhancing technologies. Obviously, this one pays for itself much faster uh, in Pennsylvania. But this is the first market integrated deployment. And as far as I know, the only one still in the United States, though other utilities are looking to catch up, maybe AES yeah, soon. <laughs> uh, so this is the problem. We're not seeing adoption of GETS. So why do transmission-owning utilities make the choices they make around technology, investment, et cetera? Policy work could focus on anything on this list, right? Federal laws, the energy, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC responds to federal laws um, and issues orders. NERC often responds to FERC orders and issues mandatory standards. The RTOs do transmission planning and uh, set tariffs, state laws, uh, imp- impact utility planning, public utility commissions have oversight over transmission planning. All, all these things are, are in the mix. But as we indicated, the the last big piece of the puzzle is money. And, and where are the utilities expecting to make their returns, their business? And I did put a little asterisk here that this is all applying to investor-owned utilities, and there are many models in the United States. But but uh, financial incentives drive a lot of decisions and, and prioritization at utilities as well. So uh, the other angle on that is that all regulation is incentive regulation. You're, uh, the utilities are going to be making decisions based on what gives their business longevity and profitability. So even if we're talking about complying with FERC orders, all regulation is incentive regulation uh, to some people. So Alfred Kahn is a bit of a legend in the utility regulation world. All right. So what is their business model? Generally, we're looking at a cost of service business model. Um, stop me if if any of this is totally unfamiliar, but uh, the utilities make a rate of return, say 10% on their rate base plus their expenses. That's their revenue requirement. So the rate base is basically the, the transmission infrastructure that they own, the value of that infrastructure that they own and build. Uh, so if their rate base is usually based on building $100 million lines, when you talk about why aren't you building a $250,000 DLR deployment on top of that line, if you could avoid that big expense, well, that big expense is your bottom line. <laughs> so uh, there's there's a really perverse incentive there for the transmission-owning utilities. That's not to say that they wouldn't do it if it was trivial to do, truly trivial, but it does take those upgrades that we talked about in his presentation. Um, so it's not automatic. It does take work. Um, so why are we stuck at the status quo? Uh, I, I think this is a, a illustrative um example to pull in some other technologies like high performance conductors or in a regional transmission line. So business as usual is that a utility does asset replacement, they do local upgrades within their territory. It's very simple to uh, rate base those upgrades. Uh, And the regulators have been looking at the same proposals for decades and decades. Now on the grid enhancing technology side, you have lower upfront costs and you might need some innovation in your modeling and your operations. Um, and it has little impact on the utility rate base. So the utilities are essentially incentivized to tell their regulator, you know, there's actually, this is going to be difficult. It's not going to be effective. Uh, we have other limiting elements on the lines. Um, so the utility is not going to bring that to their regulator with a lot of enthusiasm. And on the other side of business, as usual, you have higher upfront cost projects, but potentially higher net benefits. So if you're talking about reconducting a line with a a high performance conductor that doesn't have a steel core, it has a composite core, it's stronger, it doesn't sag, it can handle higher temperatures. That's a higher upfront cost for the ratepayer. And the regulator might think, are you gold plating this project? Do you actually need that um, higher performance conductor? And with an interregional transmission line, similarly, uh, maybe you can share power, you can get more um, capacity, you can address reliability concerns with interregional lines, but you have to allocate the cost between different groups of ratepayers. So 
we we end up stuck at business as usual and it's hard for or, you know regulators have to push for both gets and these more complicated solutions and you want utilities pushing for those as well uh, so that's the policy challenge at its core. And uh, this is restating some of what Hui already said. We need transmission capacity yesterday. We can't be stuck at business as usual, where some examples from developers uh, that it was going to take four years just to schedule an outage to begin constructing an upgrade. Gets you often don't need an outage or you need a very short outage to make that upgrade. Uh, or maybe another example, seven years to complete an upgrade. Um Interconnection costs are routinely uh, $100 million plus for projects or clusters, and that's not feasible. That's that's killing projects. Uh, also, doing things the traditional way is getting harder because there's supply chains for transformers and high-voltage DC components are back-ordered. There's... Um, a if you, if you want to build a line, you better be planning many years in, in advance. Uh, Plus, you have to site permit and finance the line. And congestion costs, which we had on his early slide, are, are growing very quickly. So we need that transmission capacity. So what, what would an incentive for GETS look like? There are a few models in the UK. Um, the And this is actually evolving in the UK, so this is going to be out of date for a while, but or very soon. But in the UK, there's a baseline of performance, and incentives are granted based on six different categories. And uh, they include also uh, potentially penalties. There's also an innovation fund to de-risk the deployment of grid enhancing technologies. Uh, in Australia, they do it a little differently. They, there are two factors that help them select GETS projects. One is when you are investing in transmission, you have to show a, a deep evaluation of multiple options. Whereas if you look at um, how Kaiso evaluates the different options, um, not we love Kaiso, but um, the, the reporting from the utilities on different options is not very in depth when they propose a transmission upgrade. Uh, but in Australia, it is in depth and that does lead to lower cost or maximum economic benefit projects being selected. Uh, and then there's also a network capacity incentive where you can earn an, an adder on your ROE essentially for um, increasing the performance of your network. In the US, uh, the Watt Coalition has proposed a shared savings incentive to FERC, which essentially says, okay, if you can address $23 million of congestion with a really low cost project, let's reward the utility for identifying that project and developing a solution. And let's also make sure that most of the benefits are still going back to the ratepayers. Uh, so that shared savings incentive has been vetted at FERC through a workshop, a technical conference, but it's not yet a notice of proposed rulemaking. So uh, a ways to go if for that to become uh, law, but on the other side, or not law, uh, policy, uh, there are requirements, and these have moved forward at FERC. So uh, if we think of all regulation as incentive regulation, this is still, in a sense, an incentive. But um, the FERC order number 2023, which uh, made new rules about generator interconnection, required transmission owners and RTOs to consider grid enhancing technologies in their interconnection processes. There's a notice of proposed rulemaking for transmission planning that does a similar uh, integration for gets into those processes. Order 881 required utilities to use ambient adjusted ratings on all of their lines and required the RTOs to prepare to accept dynamic line ratings at 15 minute intervals. Uh, so that means if a utility wants to use DLR after July 2025 and they're in an RTO, they should be able to, which uh, another technical uh, leap there for the United States. Uh, then there could be a requirement to deploy gets under certain conditions. So say you have you know, a huge amount of congestion costs on a line and it's it's historic and it's projected, uh, there, there could be a threshold that says, okay, if you see $2 million of congestion on this line going forward, you should deploy DLR and reduce that congestion somewhat. Uh, or if you're not in an RTO and trans, uh, congestion costs are not transparently reported, uh, then it could be based on the hours the line is constrained or something like that. There are also federal grants and subsidies that utilities, especially nonprofit utilities, can use to lower the upfront costs of deploying these tools. Okay, that's an overview of the, the policy landscape, but uh, we have seven minutes for questions, and this, uh, there are a bunch of slides in the appendix for a little more information about the technologies and um, the reasons we need them. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks. Well, thanks. Super interesting. Thank you. Question for you, or sort of about kind of DLRs, or yeah. I guess, well, first DLRs, but kind of like, would you maybe provide a sense of like a spatial granularity of like maybe the DLR kind of thing? It's quite 
Yeah, I assume you have some monitor, some sensor, or something. You know, is it for every line? Is it for, you know, like you just, just put one in like a model, like a ten mile radius, or how does yeah. that work? It, it depends on the line. That's the front answer. Okay. If the line changes structure many times, then you need more uh, sensors on the line sure. just to capture that wind Maybe. speed and directions. But if you have a relatively short line that doesn't change, like the you know the the turn of the line doesn't change that much, then potentially you don't need a lot of the sensors on. Mm -hmm. And there are different methodologies for DLR. So you could have a sensor on the line. You could have a sensor looking at the line from the transmission tower. There's a company that uses fiber optic cables strung along the line. So that, then you have very granular measurements of the local temperature. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I wonder for the DLR investment, it's a, it's all, although it's low cost, but it's a still need an investment. And that investment could be included in the re we pay the case or it's belong to a like, maintenance cost. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a challenge because I, I think in the UK, they've changed from, yeah, the ROE is both on capital expenditures and operations expenditures. And so that decouples the utilities revenue from just building new things. Uh, and in the United States, I think often software is considered an operational expenditure, which is a problem uh, for all kinds of uh situations but the um one thing about the federal grant programs is that they can they can apply to the staff time that it takes for training uh so that's that's a way that they can uh, subsidize the operational expenditures but yeah that, that first dlr deployment is more expensive because you have to upgrade your systems and train your staff I think that's probably the concern um from the perspective about they already have their budget for operation mm -hmm. and it's and if that could have belonged to the handling cost, and that will be much easier for utility to take it mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. or initialize. Uh, so that may be a one thing the United States could think about change some of the time mm -hmm. to, and uh, enable or give incentive for utilities to do this work uh, if they can get the first time return and can invest. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How was Pennsylvania able to implement the gets and like were, were there incentives that they use that they to use in other US cases? No, I'd say the um it's a little bit of a black box, but basically when a utility has deployed gets in the United States, it's because there's um one ambitious engineer, maybe a couple ambitious engineers. Hopefully their boss is also ambitious, but um uh, basically, it's individuals saying, we have this technology, let's use it, let's solve this problem. Um, and I think PPL had to work with PJM also to make sure that, you know, they could actually use the data to, to change their uh, dispatch. But it, yeah, there was, they, they were absolutely not incentivized to choose that solution, but they did anyways. I think there's different vendors have different approaches for communicating DLR data. Uh, and I think most of them are redundant somehow. So, you know, you'd, you'd have your default LTE system, and then maybe you'd also have a satellite system for backup. But uh, that's vendor by vendor. Yeah. And eventually, they have to comply with the SIP, the SIP standards and uh, the COM standard that's, uh, you know, required by NERC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's up to the utility customer, too, to tell yeah. the vendors what they need or want. Right back. We're talking about the um, planning side of it, and uh, we are planning on setting down the line. Uh, is, would it also apply to the protection settings? And we can be like planning to change the protection settings based on the Indian too, or would those be just set out of a setting? That's a very good question. It could, right? If, if, if you anticipate the rating change a lot, let's say. 30, 50%, then yes, you need to change, you need to consider changing your protection setup. Right. If your previous protection setup was like, you know, based on 100 megawatt rate, now you're constantly see 150, 200 megawatt rate, right? Then yes, you're right. You need to, you need to cancel that. Last question. And then uh, what about for transformers? Does the are they similarly affected by sort of higher wind speed or are you driving them a lot harder if you implement the alarm? I don't think transformer is uh, um, is heavily impacted by wind speed. However, I have also seen uh, 
vendors talking about like dynamic transfer transformer rating, uh, they might have a different set of uh, you know measures other than the you know wing direction or wing speed. Mm -hmm. Same answer. I've heard of it, but I don't know how it works. Because you know it's it's very short. It's sitting in a substation, not mm -hmm. like the long right long line. Okay. Thanks, everyone.